This is She's on Call, a weekly show hosted by ENT specialist Dr. Sajana Chandra Shaker and general surgeon Dr. Marina Kurian. They'll be joined by guest experts to discuss an array of newsworthy medical and health issues. You're invited to ask the doctors anything. The physicians and their guests' views are their own and do not represent any institution. Please contact your doctor for any personal questions. Please hit share and join us live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at She's On Call. Hashtag She's On Call. Please welcome our hosts. Hello, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear surgeon in New York City and New Jersey. I'm Marina Curry, and as you guys know, she's always trying to trip me up at the beginning of the show. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm a general surgeon, and I do uh, weight loss and... Um, and other minimal invasive surgery in New York City. We have a great show today. We do, and you know what, Marina? It's the first week of prep that I have not been nervous because we finally get to talk about something I actually know something about. You know a lot about a lot, as we all know, uh, <laughs> but from the show, from all these weeks of doing it, but it's it's exciting. Um, and actually, Sujana didn't know this, but I almost went into ENT and I didn't, um, but that would have been so weird. Then this would have been the ENT show. That would have been awesome. Uh, we are we are going to talk about hearing health, uh, hearing aids, cochlear implants, listening to music, playing music, what happens to our brains. We have two wonderful guests today. Dr. Shelley Chada is the WHO's, the World Health Organization's Director of Programs for Hearing Loss and Deafness. Uh, for the prevention of hearing loss and deafness. And Dr. Charles Lim is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, the director of their Cochlear Implant Center and the president of uh, elect of the American Auditory Society and a quite famous um, music and the brain researcher as well as cochlear implant surgeon. We're gonna meet them in a few minutes um, and uh, please like and share and uh, tag your friends, anybody who cares about listening and music um, and- uh, And hearing. Fun. And hearing. And hearing. We all exactly. care about hearing. Actually, it's so funny. I mean, it, it impacts so many of us. So this show is going to be wonderful to to see um, and and hear. And it's also closed captioned uh, on Facebook. And um, but so you know, it's an important show because it affects everything. Like uh, Sujana actually sees my parents for for hearing loss. They both refuse to wearing hearing aids. So I think that's an abject failure on her part. But whatever. <laughs> You know, we'll work through this. Um, but but we, as you guys know, we do talk of uh, the news of the week. And this week has been like really very important in medicine. Um, a lot of uh, great things have happened for people. And there's also, it's also like every great thing, there's some sad sadness attached to it as well. But this was National Match Week. Uh, National Match Day is one day, but there are some people that don't match. So, you know, we have to um, do what we call the scramble um, it, it, that whole week. Uh, but Suju, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's happening on this slide. Right. So um, for those who don't know, when you, to become a doctor, you have to go to medical school. Then you have to apply for and match into a residency program. Um, and only then can you practice as a physician. So um, you apply into whatever field you like, for example, general surgery for Marina, ENT surgery for me. In fact, six and a half percent of matriculants uh, matched to psychiatry this year, uh, which is an all time high for them. There were over 42,000 students uh, applying for only 38,000 positions. So on Monday, they found out if they matched. And then on Friday this past week, they found out where they matched. And in that interim, the students who did not match did something called SOAP, which is Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program, where they re-interviewed at places that had open slots and tried to match there. There's something called a scramble where you're just furiously tapping on your keyboard, uh, sort of like trying to get a COVID shot, but trying to get a job so you can do what you've been trained to do. Um, and we have this graphic from NRMP, which is the National Resident Matching Program. Um, and it shows five applicants 
uh, four of whom matched and one of whom didn't, despite how uh, this particular person ranked. So um, there's actually a video on there if you want to understand it better. NRMP.org has a really interesting video. This that's what this picture is from. But this is um such a happy time for so many people. And unfortunately, as Marina said, um, you know, frustrating for others. Right. And I think the important thing is, you know, everybody has a strategy for the match. You go through, you have an advisor in med school who tells you what to do. And um, I ended up ranking, I think, like 12 or 13 programs to match at one, right? And in some scenarios, people only rank one but they're not supposed to, you, you can't actually tell them, listen, you're number one. There's a lot of stuff you're not supposed to do, but that that kind of does happen behind the scenes. But when you're when you're the one scrambling, um, it, it is can be life changing. And we've had some prior guests from our show who actually didn't match at their prior at their um, their at their first choice in terms of career. And well, these are actually our, our prior guests who did match exactly where they wanted to, which is so wonderful. Um, both the students, London and Carmen, uh, matched in, in where they wanted to match, which was wonderful. But our prior guests, Valerie Fitzhugh, are, are at Dr. FNA and Agnieszka Solberg, who is an interventional radiologist, they both initially didn't actually match in their desired choice. And what they did is, you know, that whole phrase, which can sound really... Uh, annoying after a while. If you if life gives you lemon lemons, make lemonade. I mean, I think that this is something that you do when you when when you take a detour uh, from where you thought your trajectory was. It's how you how you traverse that and how you manage it that really ultimately determines your your career. And those are the two that didn't start off on their path. They ended up where they want to be and completely happy. Um, I you know so you didn't know this, but I also. Once you do your your medical school match, there's other matches, fellowship match, right? So yep. I did general surgery, and then I entered the ped surgery match like three times, and I didn't match in pediatric surgery. But what happened is I I bumped into one of my classmates from med school, and he said, "Don't do ped surge, do laparoscopic surgery." And I was like, "Are you sure? I really like to touch stuff, you know. Like when I operate, I like to touch things, like the organs and stuff. I know that sounds creepy, but it's." you know, it's, we're surgeons. I like to, anyway. So he was like, no, trust me, you're going to love it. And and if it hadn't been for him, I, I would have had a completely different trajectory, right? So even I right. had it's, experienced uh, right. what was considered adversity, but really changed my life completely. I mean, I'm so happy where I am and, and happenstance, but it's also what you make of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, the match is slightly crazy or super crazy. Um, I matched in my fellowship before the match, which was even crazier, because then it was, you know, you better tell me by 5 p.m. today, you better do this, you better do that. So there has to be a better way. There also have to be enough slots. You know, we've talked before that kids are graduating $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 in debt. Um, and for them to graduate medical school and then not be able to do their internship year so they can't actually work as physicians is really crazy. So the, um, the we have a graph that shows that the number of medical students is much higher than the available number of residency spots, um, which is the PGY-1, which is the postgraduate year one spot. And so the American Association of Medical Colleges is really um, asking the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which kind of sets these numbers and the national government to increase the slots for residency so that all of these very highly trained medical students can go on to practice. But let's switch gear and talk a little bit about COVID before we meet our guests. Well, no, we're gonna talk just about COVID vaccines. How exciting, right? Like yes. let's look at um, uh, what's happening now. We actually surpassed in I think 58 days, 100 million doses that um, the current administration wanted to get out there. So that's really fantastic news. Uh, but we have a graph also looking at our, yep, of uh, worldwide what the dosing is being. And and uh, this is, you know, it speaks to inequity. Obviously, there are many countries that don't even have any shots in hand yet. Um, but, uh, you know, our goal is in, in to cover 75% of the population in the U.S., so that's good. But um, let's just talk quickly about the Canadian situation, Sujana. 
Right. So in Canada, so normally if you get a Pfizer vaccine, you're supposed to get the second one three weeks later. If you get a Moderna vaccine, you get the second one four weeks later. And then Johnson & Johnson is the single shot. But in Canada, they are actually delaying the second shot of the two that need two up to four months or at four months um, because they want to get everyone a single shot. Um, we're not sure about the science behind that. There was a study showing the efficacy of even a single shot in England. They looked at a number of elderly patients. They sort of mapped out what would happen um, if a certain, if for a group of elderly who didn't get a shot at all, um, and then a group of elderly who got one shot, and the rate of hospitalization and death and severe disease is significantly less with even the one shot. But we'll have to see whether the Canadian delay of four months is um, science or a weird social experiment. Okay. Um, we have to switch note. gears, right? We're going to switch note. gears and talk about <laughs> science, really, and, and what can be done in public health. And so joining us again is our guest, Dr. Shelly Chada, who is the WHO director or the WHO director for programs for the prevention of deafness and hearing loss. And Dr. Charles Lim, professor and chief of otology at UCSF and president-elect of the American Auditory Society, will be talking about hearing health, hearing loss, how noise can damage your hearing, cochlear implants, and our brains on music, not drugs. Welcome, <laughs> you guys. We're so happy to have you here, reminding our viewers that we are live on Facebook, where we are live closed captioned, on Twitter, on YouTube, on scroll.in, and on Shree's uh, LinkedIn page. Uh, we will be broadcast on WBAI.org. Uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. on uh, Eastern Time on Monday. So we're really happy to meet Dr. Tada and Dr. Lim, and maybe we'll just get started right away. Um, let's start with how the ear works. So maybe, uh, uh, Shelley, can you just explain to us what happens from out here uh, in? And then, Charles, I'm going to have you pick it up and tell us what happens in the brain. Right. So thanks, uh, Sujana, for that question. And thank you, of course, for having me on the show. So putting it in a very simple way, the sound waves, they are picked up by this beautiful uh, shell-shaped structure, which we often use for adorning ourselves. But the real purpose of this is to capture the sound waves and direct them inside our uh, ear canal, as you see on this diagram here. And what the sound waves do then is they come to the end of this canal and they hit the eardrum, also known as the tympanic membrane in, in medical language. Um, so for those who are uh, familiar with that terminology. So it hits the eardrums and causes it to vibrate. And behind the eardrum sit three little bones. And these are the tiniest bones in the human body. Actually, one of them, the stapes is uh, just as a trivia, which may be interesting to for some, is the smallest uh, bone in the human body, actually. So the vibrations of this eardrum, they cause these bones also to vibrate. And then these vibrations are conveyed to what you see here, just uh, uh, marked in purple. Uh, that is the cochlea, that shelf-shaped uh, structure is the cochlea. And cochlea contains fluid. So this fluid also starts to vibrate along with the vibrations of the bones. And this causes movement of tiny little hair cells, which are tiny little hairs, which are uh, there inside our cochlea. So, you know, our cochlea contains thousands and thousands of these little hair cells, which vibrate. And this vibration is actually converted into an electrical stimulus, which is picked up by the uh, by the auditory nerve and then carried to the through the brain stem and into the brain. And, so, and I'll hand over to Dr. Lim to explain what happens in the brain. And I want to show you because I have a giant ear here. I have a giant ear behind me, but this is the ear canal. This is the ear drum. That's the middle ear. And then this is that inner ear that Dr. Chadha was talking about. The cochlea is the thing that looks like a snail here. And then those are the nerves that carry to the brain. So Charles, what happens in our brains? Sure, uh, thank you. You know, it's- You, you know, wait, before amazing. Charles, I just wanna say one thing. 
she she just pulled out that model like I, I want to go to her house now. I just want to see what else she has there. Okay. Like, oh, look. By the way, <laughs> sorry. Please continue. Yeah, everybody should have one of those in their house. Um, but you know, I think it's an amazing concept that vibrations, in the end, are perceived as an acoustical percept. And what's really happening is a reconstructive process in your brain. And so, if you think about acoustics of sound ending essentially at the cochlea, you can think of everything thereafter as being electrical in nature. And so your actual ability to hear a sound, whatever that sound is, is no longer vibrational or you know, um, uh, is really sound-based once it hits the nerve. At that point, all of this electricity is going down the auditory nerve and is hitting the brainstem. There are centers in the auditory brain that funnel the sound. They preserve things like pitch in terms of high pitch, low pitch. And each, uh, each part of the brain starts processing that sound and it sends it higher and higher up where it goes first into the brain stem and then into what's called the primary auditory cortex and then what's called secondary auditory areas. And in the end, you have this auditory experience, which can be any number of things and can have any number of impacts on you where the brain is processing that in, in different ways, depending on the relevance of the signal. Pretty remarkable process. Can you explain what's happening, Charles, in this slide? Like sure. we're looking, you know, one of your avenues of research is 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 music and the effect on the brain. And um, I have no idea what you're doing in this slide. So please explain to me. Yeah. So um, I use functional MRI scanning, which is a way to test or to measure blood flow in the brain real time during certain activities. And one of the great mysteries for, for the field, but also for me personally, has always been how it's possible that the brain can perceive or hear music but not just how it can hear it, but how it can produce it. And so in this experiment, what I was doing was having jazz musicians uh, improvise, meaning create music spontaneously in the fMRI scanner. And the purpose of this was to essentially uh, measure the creative brain in action live. And so the scans that we're showing are, are really blood flow changes that are linked to changes in electricity in the brain. So areas that are red or yellow are hot spots and areas that are blue are cold spots. And one of the amazing things in this figure is that when musicians start to go creative, there's a big cold spot that hits the uh, front part of the brain and in, in what's called the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex. And in that part of the brain, at least for these expert musicians, it appears like the brain is sort of shutting itself off in its conscious self-monitoring and effortful planning areas in order to allow for spontaneous creativity. That's really cool. So that means that when they're creating, and I have to say that you designed this amazing keyboard that can work in an fMRI without any metal in it, but um, when people are creative, their um, their inhibitions go away. Is that, that what that's showing us? I think for really trained experts, that's in a way maybe part of the goal is to get out of your own way. Um, and I think for people that are learning or amateurs, they actually have a hard time with that. And so that may be one of the hallmarks of really high level creativity. But I do think that there's all different forms of creativity and this work is really just beginning. Um, on the other hand, we now have tools that actually allow us to ask these questions and maybe try to answer them in a reasonable way. Just just so um, people understand that the MRI is a big magnet and if you bring metal in it, that's a disaster uh, uh, of, of epic proportions. So uh, Charles actually built, um, you know, you might be on an FBI watch list, sir. <laughs> If you know how to build things that are metal and, you know, you can sneak things in places. So, but uh, you built that without any metal in it. I think that's just a really amazing. Uh, so, you know, was like, isn't that amazing? I'm like, I don't know. Let me think about it. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> really well done. And uh, functional MRI has been used for so many different things. We use it uh, in, in uh, diagnosis of obesity. It's used also in addiction to see like what parts of the brain light up. It, it's actually a great uh, way to really... Um, ascertain how the brain's working and and in reaction to different things, right? So it's really wonderful way to use um, that that um, device or whatever that that uh, procedure to really identify what's happening for patients. So I think we'll pull it back a little bit and just talk about hearing loss across the world. And you know, the World Health Organization has really done amazing work. 
um, identifying the scope of this problem and why it's important and trying to find the ways we can intervene to make that graph that's going up in terms of hearing loss across the world flatten and go down. So Shelley, maybe you can talk to us a bit about what the WHO has found. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sujana. And you're right about uh, these recent findings, which we've published uh, just um, a couple of weeks back on, in the World Report on Hearing, uh, which is that uh, globally about 1.5 billion people have hearing loss. And this number, it has been rising in the past decades, and it is likely that this will continue to rise. Um, <clears throat> if the current trends continue the way uh, things are, it continues. And out of this uh, 1.5 billion people, what WHO estimates is that about a third of them, so nearly 500 million actually need, uh, actively require services and intervention in order to uh, have good functioning in their day-to-day -day life. So that is uh, something. and and. I can go, if you like, into the the reasons why this graph is going up and so on, but I'll, I'll hand back to you to let me know when you want me to do that. Sure, now's a good time. Yeah. yeah. So thanks. And of course, the reason why the number is going to go on increasing, you know, from 1.5 billion to 2.5 in 2050 is because, well, there will be more humans uh, living on this planet uh, in 2050, there will be nearly 10 billion of us, or just short of 10 billion is what is projected. Um, but the reason is that, of course, is the change in the demography. We will have more humans and we, we are living longer. We are living, growing um, older. So the world populations are aging. So that also contributes to this uh, increase in numbers. But what is also important here is to are the risk factors the risk factors for hearing loss which are on one hand persisting and, and some risk factors which are also increasing so when i talk about risk factors which are persisting these are risk factors like ear infections you know common ear infections uh which are very common in many parts of the world uh, they they are persisting because people do not have access to the services. But also what is on rise and a risk factor which we didn't have so much uh, prior to the last, uh, I would say this last decade, um, is listening to loud music over, over our headphones and earphones. So with um, the easy access to listening to music through our devices, this is a risk factor which is currently also on the rise. And while uh, music is uh, is really, it is so essential for us, not just for our, uh, you know, just for, uh, well, enjoyment and recreation, but even for mental health, it, it is amazing. But when heard at very loud levels, it leads to hearing loss. And this hearing loss is, is completely, um, irreversible it is however preventable so that's one of the things which is driving up this so, uh, so shelly is it is it that um you know since the um the walkman right right i don't know most people don't know what the walkman is but i think <laughs> yeah, well. yeah uh but since the walkman since um I, I have earbuds in now but i never i don't ever use these really except you know sometimes when i'm working out i pop them in i don't listen to music like that I like to blare it in my car, but is it worse because the headphones are here and people are maybe not using um, um, appropriate levels or you want to hear certain things really loud? Or is it also that it's just so close to your ear? And then the last question is those particular earbuds that like really fit and are noise canceling, are they better for you? Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for those questions, uh, Marina. So, the proximity of the earphones to the ears, um, well, it contributes in a sense that it makes it private and, and it's only in your ears. You don't have any, you know, attenuation. If you're listening to music through a speaker, then there will be some attenuation, some reduction in intensity if you're uh, sitting far away. So yes, in that way. But ultimately, I think the 
the problem lies that yes, people do like to listen to music a little loud. And sometimes it's not even that they like to listen to it like that. They just get used to listening to it like that. And very often people have to uh, turn up the volume because uh, there's so much background noise around them because they're in a train or in a bus and uh, they can't hear their music unless they turn it up really loud. So that's where the noise cancelling headphones are actually useful. So they can, or earphones, uh, they are useful because uh, they reduce the need to drive the volume up. So in that way, that's helpful, yes. We have a viewer named Jan Myers who's asking about the relationship of hearing loss and dementia. So Charles, let's talk a bit about what happens to adults with untreated hearing loss. Maybe all the things that they are potentially facing if they're not diagnosed and then they're not treated. And by treatment, we mean, you know, hearing aids, removing earwax, fixing their eardrum, whatever the treatment involves. Yeah, very important topic. Thank you for the uh, question. You know, I think in recent years, um, maybe in the past uh, 10 to 20 years, there's been a growing emphasis on understanding the relationship between hearing loss and aging, and in particular with healthy aging. Um, and there's been a lot of important work that's showing um, very important associations between hearing loss and decline in certain cognitive and other, um, you know, uh, well-being parameters later in life. And so the actual impact of this, if you kind of go through it medically, psychologically, financially, I mean, it's astonishing how much hearing loss seems to matter for things like cognition. And I think it sort of speaks to the fact that hearing loss has been an under-recognized or under-appreciated um, uh, limitation for many people, and that there are simple things that can be in place that will drastically, uh, we hope, reduce the impact of this hearing loss on these other uh, brain faculties that are declining. And so it is certainly, I think, um, preventable and treatable. And there's so much that can be done that's quite easy uh, to uh, reduce the potential damaging impacts of hearing loss on the brain. You know, we, um, you know, like cardiologists use EKGs, uh, ear doctors use audiograms. So we actually want to compare apples to apples when we're talking to people. So when we have uh, our colleagues in audiology you, uh, do a proper hearing test on somebody, uh, we have a graph just showing what normal hearing is up to about uh, the ability to hear sounds across a range of frequencies to about 25 decibels. And then we have mild hearing loss, moderate, moderately severe, severe, and profound hearing loss. And I think each of these is treated differently. There's also different types of hearing loss. So Shelley, maybe you can talk to us about what's the difference between a conductive hearing loss and a sensory neural hearing loss. And I have to tell you, when we were preparing for the show, this was Marina's point. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. People don't know this either. Well, so, it's because I have a conductive hearing loss. <laughs> this has been a great show. Like, it's so funny because she thought it was all about her. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. This show is actually about me. So anyway, please, yeah. Shelley. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marina. I also wanted to a comment on the question which uh, somebody posed about the relation between hearing loss and dementia. Actually, uh, this Lancet Commission on, uh, on Dementia, which was published a couple of years uh, back, uh, what it showed was that uh, hearing loss in adults is the single most common modifiable risk factor which predisposes to dementia. So what that means is that by taking care of uh, of hearing loss in older in in adults essentially, um, and making sure that they do not face its impact, we can reduce the onset of dementia in in people as they age. So I just wanted to add that. But coming back to your point, Marina, about uh, about the the severity of hearing loss and also what it means. So. Um, Really, if you look at mild hearing loss, that that commonly remains undetected because uh, people may not even notice that they have this hearing loss. The only time when it may bother them is when they're in a noisy restaurant uh, and, and are talking to a group of friends and they can't make out clearly what someone is saying. 
So that could just be the kind of problem an individual faces. Uh, and those who have moderate or moderately severe hearing loss have increasingly more difficulty in routine conversation. So they may have problems if they're in a meeting or if they are uh, you know, just sitting and, and conversing normally to be able to understand and to be able to, sorry, hear and to be able to understand what that person is saying. Um, and as well as, and as it, uh, the severity increases, this uh, difficulty increases till we reach profound hearing loss where a person may not be able to hear anything. <clears throat> this is uh, the conductive type of hearing loss, which is mostly mild or moderate or could be moderately severe. It is usually caused due to problems in that eardrum and the little bones that we uh, spoke about earlier. Uh, so that is where the problem lies, either in the external part of the ear or in the middle part of the ear. Whereas the sensory neural hearing loss, as the name itself applies, uh, the problem usually lies either at the level of the, of the cochlea, so the sensory part of the ear, or at the level of the nerve, the auditory nerve. So that is the difference between the two. <clears throat> So we have this graphic that's very complicated, but it shows sort of what Shelley was talking about, where it's an ear canal or eardrum or middle ear problem is a conductive or more mechanical problem, whereas an inner ear and nerve and brain problem is more of a what we call sensory neural or nerve hearing loss. And again, Marina, the obesity surgeon, pointed out to me that we use tuning forks. So mm -hmm. Charles, what can you do with a 512 hertz tuning fork other than tune those beautiful instruments behind you? Yeah, I know it's, uh, we're pretty uh, good at getting information out of tuning forks that are, would surprise some people. But when, when you hear a tuning fork, uh, you're, it's putting out what's something that's known as a pure tone. So it's essentially one frequency vibrating. And that's sort of the beauty of it. Um, it's it's a kind of thing that's not commonly found in nature uh, other than in a tuning fork and in a synthesizer. And what you're doing is testing the ability of the body to hear either through the actual normal ear canal eardrum, which is called air conduction, or you actually physically put the uh, vibrating um, tuning fork on the patient's body, usually on the mastoid bone, which is sitting right behind the ear, or potentially you could put it on the forehead or any number of other places in the body to see if the sound is being conducted by bone conduction. And if you have a significant conductive hearing loss, you'll do something that's called flipping your forks, which is where suddenly the sound will be louder through the bone than through the air. In normal situations, because your, uh, your hearing conduction is very effective, you hear best through your ear canal and eardrum. How about screening? How are we screening for this? You know, I, I remember doing this in, in, in school. And um, I know you're supposed to do it when you're younger. I don't, I mean, I don't know if they did it. I mean, we did it. I, I also did some pediatric uh, critical care. And um, when with the babies, we would do the little, you know, trying to get them to, to make little noises by their ears. But that, I, I, that wasn't our shtick, right? Like, but we just did some as part of screening. Um, but I know I went through it in school, probably because I had a little lisp, which I kind of still have <laughs> for different reasons. But um, um, that, is one form of uh, screening, but when do you then subsequently screen people other than when I call Sujan and, and tell her that my parents are deaf and they won't listen to me because they can't hear me. Um, <laughs> but when, what, what is the screening process for children and also adults? So I'll tell you, I think we, um, you know, we have universal newborn hearing screening in the United States across just about every state, I think. Um, that's not present in much of the rest of the world. So the early, Marina's right, the earlier we can screen and identify hearing issues, the better the kids will do. Um, maybe Charles, we talked a bit about what happens to adults with hearing loss. Can you tell us what children face uh, if they have untreated hearing loss? And there is a question about what do we do about single-sided hearing loss. And I think that question is different in children and adults as well. Yes. Um, so the issue of children with hearing loss is, you know, hugely devastating for many, many children and families. And I think it's in, very crucial, I think, to know how frequently we see, you can see from this slide, um, how, how many children are going to have hearing issues. And because it's not one of these immediately visible 
uh, situations, it's often under-recognized even by a child's family and certainly the, the child themselves often can't um, advocate for themselves. And so as we learn more about this, we're, we're realizing that it's a huge uh, problem that we have globally where children that are being born with hearing loss then have a sort of domino effect of issues that affect their speech development and their cognitive development and their ability to sort of function in these uh, school environments that really rely on the ability to hear well. And so there's often an assumption that people have normal hearing. Now, um, when you think about the uh, sort of screening processes that are in place, hopefully the net result of all of this will be greater awareness of the need for better hearing services, better hearing uh, testing, uh, but also I think a sense that it shouldn't just be the kind of thing that you evaluate when somebody has an obvious problem. Sometimes by the time a patient is aware that they've had a major problem, it's it's really a, a lot of damage has already been done and things could have been prevented if you had intervened sooner. And so it's my hope that what will eventually happen is that not only will patients come in when they've you know had a catastrophic change in hearing, but there's a routine uh, concept of getting your hearing evaluated, sort of sort of like a well hearing check um, that where you can get a sense of the status of your hearing, whether you're a child or an adult. You know, I think uh, that is terrific. I think the I think like everything else, screening and early intervention really helps. Um, Shelley, the World Health Organization has this sort of um, acronym, hearing, that relate that really talks about all the ways we can intervene before, during, and subsequently when there's a hearing loss. Maybe you can talk to us about that because it's not only all of the uh, social and medical burdens that we've talked about, but there's a huge economic burden to having untreated hearing loss. Indeed. <clears throat> In the report I mentioned earlier, Sujana, WHO estimated that unaddressed hearing loss is actually costing the world $980 billion each year. So, so this was what it cost the world in 2019. And of course, uh, depend as the numbers go on increasing, this cost could very well go on rising. So WHO has proposed a package of interventions which uh, looks at hearing loss. It takes a life course perspective and what this package, which is uh, acronymized, not very innovatively, as here the hearing package of interventions it talks about is uh, firstly the starting point which is hearing screening uh, and early intervention so for babies and children uh, for children in school also for adults who are at higher risk of hearing loss so hearing screening for adults who are in occupational uh, who face occupational noise or are exposed to chemicals which can uh, you know lead to hearing loss at work uh, and then also in adults, in older adults, so as a means of identifying hearing loss early and then uh, making sure we follow it up with interventions. In addition to this, it talks about ear disease prevention and management. So because I mentioned that ear infections are a very important and avoidable cause of hearing loss. Um, then it talks about access to technologies because the ones hearing loss has been identified, you need to rehabilitate with the use of often with the use of uh, hearing technology and then with rehabilitation services. It also talks about, uh, you know, access to to sign language uh, as well as to services like captioning, which is so vital for uh, people who have hearing loss to be able to access information. Um, it talks about noise control and it talks also about something that I think we really need to talk more about, which is greater community engagement. And this is uh, why what we consider a key component of addressing hearing loss, which is to address the stigma which surrounds hearing loss. So, but I'm going to stop here. So I'll tell you, I think that that leads really well into um, the concept of hearing aids and personal sound amplification products. We have a question about why Medicare, which covers elderly people in the United States, does not cover hearing aids. Yeah. I wish I had an answer. I wish I had an answer why resident medical students can't get jobs. I wish I had an answer why Medicare won't cover an absolutely needed service, which we have learned today will prevent 
the progression and onset of dementia in the vast majority of people who need hearing aids. But can we um, talk a bit about the different types of hearing aids that are available? We have a little graphic showing the different sizes. Um, and I'm gonna ask Shelly about this um, because then we're gonna go on to cochlear implants. And I'm gonna ask Charles about that. Sure. So <clears throat> hearing aids, of course, come in uh, different forms and shapes. And, and maybe this graphic can help people to see what are the kind of shapes they come in. Um, and the shape that you choose will depend upon, well, how comfortable you are with these shapes, both in terms of its uh, cosmesis, but also in handling these. So it can be a behind the ear hearing aid, like you see on the right side um with uh, with a uh, with an ear mold or it can be uh, in the ear hearing aid like you see and then in the canal which are not even visible but what is more important is the technology which is within these hearing aids which is really a uh, digital uh, hearing aid so we have uh, very few now analog hearing aids by and large it is digital technology and the hearing aids can be programmed to suit the uh, to match the hearing loss so the shape of the audiogram which you saw earlier so they can be programmed according to the uh, shape of the audiogram so that the the user can have full benefit from these uh, hearing aids shelley um there are uh, outreach efforts all over the world. I know uh, Sujin is involved with a group that goes out and we have a slide of one from Nicaragua. Can we talk about how audiology services are rolled out around the world and, and what are the options for, for countries that you know, may maybe um, not have the resources that we have here? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the World Report on Hearing actually talks about all these problems. So. Uh, maybe I, I can also post a link to that. Uh, it's a big report, but there are summaries and then a summary of the summaries, so, so people may <laughs> uh, browse through whatever whatever they are able to. Uh, but essentially, it, it talks about a lot of these problems because, as you've mentioned, what we face is that a huge lack of human resources. So both human resources as well as services for uh, hearing care and, and for ear diseases as well are lacking in, well, you saw on the earlier slide that 80% of those who have hearing loss live in low and middle income countries of the world. And this is where these services are commonly lacking because human resources are lacking um, and, and the, there is often also not that demand for these services because of the lack of awareness in the society. So what um, this World Report proposes are ways in which governments can act within their, well, they have to allocate resources to this, but also, um, also it is about making sure that there are human resources and they don't always have to be highly trained human resources. So it talks about strategies like task sharing. So how can, um, well, carders with lesser training uh, undertake some of the tasks and share them with the more highly trained resources like ENT doctors and audiologists. Because in many of the countries, there are uh, there is one audiologist serving the needs of 5 million people or, or more. So um, it talks about these strategies. It also talks about strategies like, uh, well, telehealth. So telehealth and how this can bridge this gap. So how can countries act within the current situation and context to bridge this gap in services? Um, and, and there's a lot of innovation in our field, both in terms of technology. So a lot of digital innovations for screening. So screening can actually take place. You talked about newborn hearing screening, but screening can be done also in any situation in clinical and community settings because of all the digital technology. And what we are trying to promote through this world report is also innovation in service delivery so that we can uh, develop these in, uh, in countries and, uh, and provide services to those who are in need of them. You know, we, uh, you answered a question as you were talking, Catherine Parr, who is a student at the University of Pennsylvania, asked a question about 
um, uh, equitable access for hearing technology in the rest of the world. And I think this is really important. One of the issues is batteries, right? So we need hearing aids that are solar charged because where are you gonna pick up a battery in certain, when there's one audiologist for 5 million people? Um, let's shift a little. We talked a bit about those hair cells and we talked about the loss of those hair cells that happens with noise exposure and with um, aging. And we have a, a, a whole mount section of two cochleas, two inner ears that I got from the late Dr. Myron Shapiro. Um, and this shows on the left, the black is staining all of those hair cells in a 17 year old boy's inner ear. And you can see that it's full of black pretty hair cells. And then on the right, you see a 72 year old man who worked in a noisy industry. And you can see that almost all of those hair cells are gone. And um, when that person can no longer benefit from a hearing aid, Charles, what is a, an option for that person in order to be able to continue to hear and communicate? Yeah, so one of the most amazing, uh, really a medical miracle of our generation is um, the fact that cochlear implants have become commonplace. And so a cochlear implant is a device that takes over where the acoustic hearing fails. And so if you have a problem where hearing aids are just not powerful enough to sort of overcome the deficit of neurons that are lacking or hair cells that have been damaged, the cochlear implant is a wire, uh, a complicated uh, wire electrode that gets inserted into the inner ear and electrically stimulates the neurons that then go on to deliver the electrical energy to the brainstem and so forth. And so it's a really ingenious um, idea, but it's also, I think, astonishingly simple that it could work. And the reason why, you know, it's surprising. To date, there's no FDA-approved drugs for hearing loss, which is just a remarkable fact. Yet, we also have the, um, if, if you had to lose any sensory modality, we're the furthest along in medicine with hearing. And so that, that duality or that dichotomy is very kind of striking. And part of the reason why sticking a wire into the inner ear works is because the inner ear has a spatial organization. It's, it's physically organized in a way that makes itself amenable to electricity being delivered in an organized way. So the high pitches are taking place in that part of the um, inner ear that's called the base, the widest turn of that cochlea. And as you get, if you kind of go up the spiral of the inner ear, as you get to the apex or the very sort of top point of it, the frequencies are getting lower and lower in pitch, more, more bass-like. And that kind of mathematical organization of the inner ear um, can be mimicked by these electrodes that are delivering the sound in a sort of frequency-specific way. And the end result of that is that you have relatively good preservation of that information, exactly, uh, relatively good preservation of that information when you get it back to the brain. Now, you can just compare the electrode design of any cochlear implant to the neurons of the inner ear and the hair cells of the inner ear, and you know right away it's not as sophisticated as the native ear. So we have a, a long way to go, but these, uh, the, these implant designs are amazing technology, and you can absolutely transform somebody's life who's been, who's been deaf and struggling with hearing loss and hearing aids. So, and it, this can be used also for people who are born deaf, right? Correct. So there's many different applications. You can be generally born and deaf. And when do you when do you intervene? Because like we, I, I, you know, um, I was at Lenox Hill in in New York and um, and at NYU, and both of them do like if there's like a genesis of the ear, they'll rebuild and reconstruct an ear. But there's also obviously putting in the the cochlear implant, but. What's that timing like, Charles? So theoretically, the earlier, the better. So if you're an infant, you really want to be uh, implanted as soon as you can. Now, there's FDA guidelines of either six months or 12 months, depending on which company you're using. But uh, around a year or so is about the age you'd want to implant a child. And th there was a question about uh, senior citizens. Absolutely. The, the oldest person I've implanted is 96 years old. But as long as somebody can medically handle a two-hour outpatient procedure um, and the sort of wherewithal to understand what, what is taking place with respect to the device, almost anybody can get the cochlear implant if they qualify from a hearing perspective and benefit from it significantly. I, I love those videos of, um, you know, when, when babies can start to hear, right? Like, and, and they hear their mother and just that, that joy. I mean, it's, it's, it's heartbreakingly beautiful when you see that. Yeah. And just to tie, 
to, to tie together the earlier conversations, it's actually music that is pointing out some of the limitations of cochlear implants. So they're very good at speech and they're really designed for speech. And it suggests that speech is a more uniform, in a way easier signal for a cochlear implant device to transmit. Whereas something like music is just, I think orders of magnitude more complicated. And it shows in a way how far we have to go to obtain perfect hearing with something like a cochlear implant. But hopefully that's down on the horizon where one day we can really restore natural hearing. What's the cost of a cochlear implant like US and worldwide? I would imagine it's very expensive. It, it is expensive. You know, the, the devices themselves, you know, they, there's obviously different cost to build and cost to, to purchase it, but it's it's many thousands of dollars I'm on the order of about twenty five to thirty five thousand dollars to actually purchase the device typically from the companies. Um, and then their surgical anesthetic costs, and so forth. But if you compare that to the number that we just saw, that huge cost of untreated hearing loss that that Shelley was discussing, if you compare those costs to to the you know tremendous issues of hearing loss, it's a really a very small amount of money. You know, I just because my house is so awesome, I wanted to show you guys. This is an in the ear hearing aid, an in the canal hearing aid. That's the size of it. And then this is the external. So the cochlear implant has an internal part and an external part. So the external part sits on the ear like this and goes behind and attaches with a uh, connects with a magnet that's on the inside. Um, so the technology, as Charles says, was really cool. It is expensive, but um, the return on investment of of uh, having that exp of of expending that amount of money is. Uh, remarkable. And I think, Shelly, you wanted to point out that this is not a license to go and abuse your ears with noise. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Susanna. <laughs> because, of course, um, we are blessed that we have the miracle of cochlear implant as an option for people who lose their hearing or who are born without hearing. Um, however, it, it is uh, it remains out of reach for uh, a lot of the world's population currently because of the cost and also because of the uh, human resources, the audiology required around it, the rehabilitation which must accompany. And it is for anybody who goes down uh, that path, it is a fairly intense uh, treatment to undergo. So uh, I just wanted to point that out that it should not be considered as a uh, as an easy fix for, and I think it's important to take care of our hearing and hearing loss, the one as uh, Sujana showed in an industrial worker, 72 years old and how uh, his hearing, his or her hearing uh, you know, cells were kind of uh, just gone. And it's important to know that we can prevent this. We can avoid this from happening by protecting our ears. So the music that we spoke about earlier, listening to loud music, that is what is what this is going to lead to. Um, and as uh, <clears throat> and as Charles also mentioned, I think if even a cochlear implant cannot bring those musical notes back, it, it can to a certain extent for sure. Uh, but that clarity of sound which your natural ears give you a cochlear implant till now um, is not able to provide. And of course, cochlear implants are uh, are evolving and I'm sure in the future they will be able to do that. But it is possible to prevent that hearing loss. And um, WHO actually estimates that a billion people are at risk of hearing loss simply because of the way they are listening to music. And we want to really prevent that. And, uh, and of course, if people still develop hearing loss, uh, there are amazing technologies like cochlear implants and hearing aids available. For you, them. you know, some of the most, we talked about people listening to loud music, but um, many of my family are rock musicians. So yeah, there's a significant amount of hearing loss there. And actually probably the most famous person, not rock musician, but played loud music was, you know, probably Beethoven who had, who, who was deaf at the end of his life, right? So. It's uh, it, just listening to music is one thing, but also performing and creating can have its impact as well. We had a question uh, from Tom Etchery about whether insurance companies actually cover cochlear implants. Is that universal? Is that like a universal coverage decision or is it really very specific to certain insurances? In the US, obviously. 
actually maybe the NHS. Do, do you guys know if the NHS or, or, or it's covered in Canada? So it's uh, in the United States, most insurances, including Medicare, will cover uh, cochlear implants, especially if you have hearing in both ears. Um, implants are covered for single-sided deafness by many insurance companies, but not yet by Medicare. The National Health Service absolutely covers cochlear implants in England because, the, again, the return on investment is huge. When you go from deaf to hearing with an implant, you're able to um, uh, have uh, economic involvement in in uh, the world, your health actually improves, all of the things that we talked about. Um, I think there was also a question, Charles, about um, osseointegrated implants, or Baja is a name brand, but um, when do you use an osseointegrated implant on somebody? So typically that's meant to treat a conductive hearing loss. So the world of bone conducting hearing is its own uh, large topic, but there's uh, a number of different ways to do this. One is where you place a titanium screw behind the ear, and there's two versions of that, a, a Baja and a Ponto, but there's also newer devices that are more active drives and more powerful that go under the skin. Those are primarily treating conductive hearing losses, but can also give a little boost to cover some sensory neural loss. There's also a usage where you're treating single-sided hearing loss by bone conducting the sound to the other ear. And so there are a lot of potential things that can be done. I just wanna to touch on music and cochlear implants again. So it's my experience as a cochlear implant surgeon that many of my patients like, with after their implant, like the music that they liked before. They somehow don't figure out the new music, but they like the music they liked before. It, what's happening in their brains? Is it stimulating a happiness center? What's going on in their brains, Charles? So keep in mind that listening to music or remembering a piece of music is a very, I think, intensely cognitive uh, memory uh, activation where, you know, for example, if right now you think about your favorite song, you can pause and hear it almost perfectly in your head because your auditory memory is very accurate in that way. And so for a cochlear implant user to hear a sound, even if the song is not perfectly delivered from a kind of uh, physics and acoustical energy perspective, it will activate that experience of listening to that song again and your memory can really assist or boost. On the other hand, if it's a song that you had never heard of before or music that's new to you, it's much harder because there you're just relying on the actual physics and acoustic, acoustical energy that's being transmitted into your cochlear implant and then to your nerve to try to recreate that experience. And we know it's kind of an, a relatively uh, poor experience compared to natural hearing. Oh. We're coming up on our um, uh, last few minutes together. What what would be three takeaways for our, our listeners and our viewers? Shelly, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, starting with me. Uh, so the three takeaways from my side is first, protect your hearing. So your hearing is precious and it's fragile. Once it goes, it's not going to naturally come back. So uh, take care of your hearing. Secondly, check your hearing. So check your hearing from time to time. There are amazing tools. WHO has an app called the Hear Who app. Make use of that. It's a free app. There are others out there. Check your hearing using a, a validated app from time to time. Um, and thirdly, if you have hearing loss, talk about it. Don't hide it. Talk about it so the world knows and, and the stigma around hearing loss starts to dissolve. I stop that. <laughs> and Charles, how about your takeaways? I need through new takeaways now. Well, I would say this. <laughs> you know, if, if one thing the pandemic has made very clear, it's that um, we need to hear better. And so the first thing I would say, in addition to the things that Shelley pointed out, is to recognize that other people may not hear well. And that might be a reason why it's difficult to communicate with them and that the impacts of that communication loss can be really dramatic. I think it's also important to recognize that this is an evolving field of medicine. And so we don't have all the answers yet, but we are rapidly learning new ways to try to treat hearing loss. And so in the next five years, in the next 10 years, we should hopefully have completely new options available that don't exist today. So realize that there's, there's active work being done to try to improve things. And thirdly, I would say that music um, as something which we're, I think, beginning to understand the power of from a therapeutic perspective and a well-being perspective 
is just being, uh, it's just starting to be unlocked. And so the Sound Health Network is an initiative for the National Institutes of Health and the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, which I'm co-directing through UCSF, to try to improve the understanding of the science of music and its impact on well-being in the brain. I want to thank you guys so much. We are coming up on our time. <laughs> and you can wear a mask. Yep, that you can yep, see those. You can wear a yep. clear mask so that people with hearing loss can read your lips as well. Uh-huh. So Dr. Shelly Chada, who is the WHO Director for Programs for the Prevention of Def Deafness and Hearing Loss, and Dr. Charles Lim, Professor and Chief of Otology at UCSF and President-elect of the American Auditory Society, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this, this show can't be done without our, our team and this our, our producers and executive producers. And uh, finally, you guys stay tuned for next week. We're going to talk about the back and when do we need to intervene with our back? We have our guest, Dr. Michael Smith, uh, who is a spine surgeon here in New York City, and Dr. Kimberly Sackheim, who's a physiatrist and spine rehab doctor. And it's going to be, um, that's going to be a great show as well. Thank you all. Stay safe.